Welcome to Thronecast, the official guide to Game of Thrones from Sky Atlantic HD. The plans are made. It's time you heard them. Right, so we've just watched episode three, What is Dead May Never Die. That's what I'm going to write in the next condolence card that I send. Coming up, we have an exclusive interview with some fellow who wrote some books or something. George R. R. Martin? Me either. Also, Annabelle Port will be here and she's on the hunt for another Game of Thrones superfan. We'll be conducting an audit of the assets of House Tyrell and I like to think of them as the true queens of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. Elio and Linda from Westeros.org will be here on the end of a tin can and a piece of string. Now, if you'll excuse me, the, uh, the stresses of power are having a rather insalubrious effect. So this week, we saw the lovely and romantic Sam give a gift to Craster's daughter. One question, what was that? I have no idea and I must have rewound 15 times. He explained it was something his mother used for sewing. That's a great present. I bet she can't wait for a birthday when he gives her a biro that his granny used to use for the word search. Also this week, Tyrion got his girlfriend Shay a Swiss new job as a handmaiden to Sansa. Now her duties included brushing her hair and emptying her chamber pot. And this show as well as being hugely entertaining as an education to me, I never realised you're supposed to empty a chamber pot. I've been just letting my mellow. We saw Theon convert to a new religion, the religion of the drowned god. And when they baptised him, they asked the drowned god to bless him with salt, stone and steel. That sounds like an awesome religion. Theon's dad put his sister Yara in command of a mighty armada, but just gave Theon one boat to plunder fishing villages. Look at on the bright side, he can pillage lots of lovely seafood platters. And I think it's safe to say he'll be picking up crabs. And you may not have noticed, because it was quite subtle, um, that, that there was a double entendre. When I said crabs, it could also mean like the STD, the sexually transmitted disease that you would go to a clinic for. It was a euphemism. And speaking of euphemisms, here's a fun game you can play at home. Which Game of Thrones house surnames make good euphemisms for a gentleman's testicles? For example, oh, my Baratheons are tingling. Or uh, we could have a, oh, she kicked me right in the Targaryens. Or, um, I'm off to shave my Lannisters now. Not bad. Uh, let's see if we've got another. Would you like to tickle my Greyjoys? That, that one less so. So the House Tyrell seems to be stamping its authority on Renly. But who are the people behind the back of the bed of the man who wants to be King Renly Baratheon? Kellyanne Smith has got the full lowdown. House Tyrell. Their motto? Growing strong. This house is only surpassed by the Lannisters as the richest family in all of Westeros. The Tyrells rule from the Castle Highgarden and are lords of the rich and fertile area known as the Reach, a massive area that covers the western side of the Seven Kingdoms. This week we met Marjorie Tyrell, the only daughter of Lord Mace Tyrell and his wife Lady Allery Hightower. She's shrewd and intelligent and apparently takes after her grandmother Lady Olena Redwine. There's no need for us to play games. Save your lives for court, you're going to need a lot of them. And despite her open-mindedness about Renly's relationship with her brother, to me, she looks like trouble. Your enemies aren't happy about us. They want to tear us apart. She has three brothers, Willas, Garlan and Loras. Loras, of course, being the head of Renly's King's Guard, known in the books as the Rainbow Guard. Loras was fostered at Storm's End and grew up with Renly, hence their very close relationship. Not tonight. There's another Tyrrell who requires your attention. You are a king. Wow! Marjorie, Marjorie, your charms are weighing large on me. Yet your free and easy attitude has nothing on that girl at a different latitude. Danny, oh Danny, we didn't see you at all this week. I miss your golden tresses and your power over the meek. I hope next week my thirst for you will properly be slaked. Doubly so, if there's a hope that we can see you do. Sorry, sorry. I'm feeling kind of obliged to do that now. It's like a running joke. And that's joke in the loosest sense of the word, obviously. Moving on. The hunt continues for the ultimate primary top first highest Game of Thrones superfan. Here's Annabelle, hello. Hello, Hasha Dothrichek. Oh? Jeff. Your Dothraki is not as good as it should be. I, I have fallen behind with my Dothraki lessons. You I got, have. I got one of those linguaphone tapes, <laughs> but uh, 
Yeah, but I can't find a tape machine. I was, <laughs> I was saying, how are you, of course. Uh -huh. But it does take a lot of dedication to learn Dothraki, but I know somebody who has done that. Hello, Tim Stoffel. Hello. Hello, how are, sorry. Hashia Dothracek. Anha Dothracek Ashek. I learned wow. it, I'm going to use it twice. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim, how long have you been learning Dothraki for? Anna is not like Dothraki ha at your desk if I had. Oh, about a year. I think there's a problem with what you... <laughs> yeah, about a year, yeah. <laughs> and um, how extensive is your vocabulary? How many words do you know? Anna had a sack a cat can as most but a sack to gender as check desa. A lot. Wow, I mean, that is, that is impressive. And is it easy to learn, like, say, Esperanto or Spanish, or are we talking Mandarin difficult? Like the Thraki, Osa, Orojanad, like Woon, Tawaka, Osma, Anrojanad, San, Woon, like Obe. Oh, very interesting. Mm, mm. Surprising. Yeah. Yep. Now, you're impressed, I can tell. Hugely so. Yes. But he's not the only person who can speak it like that. But I think he's the only person who can do what he's about to do. Now, if the Dothraki are around today, what would you say would be their national anthem? Um, Dothraki Uber Alice? <laughs> I don't no, know. No, you're wrong. It would be Gloria Gain as I will survive. Of course it would, yeah. Turns out that's very difficult to translate into Dothraki. Is, is but, that right? Tim, you have an alternative? I do. Do you want to take it away? The world premiere of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in Dothraki. Wow. Oh, wow. That was amazing. Is it just me or does anybody else think a great business idea would be Dothraki karaoke? <laughs> Tim, I would say thank you, but of course there's no word for thank you in Dothraki. So instead I should say Dothras check. Dothras check. Right well. And if you think you can do better, get in touch. You can follow us on Twitter at Thronecast, you can be our friend on Facebook, or just email us gameofthrones at sky.com. <laughs> Last weekend was Easter, and that means EasterCon. Not the price of chocolate eggs, which is frankly outrageous, but a gathering of fans of fantasy and science fiction literature. They mingled, they discussed, they obsessed, and then in the evening, they got drunk and disappeared into dark corners to fumble with each other, probably. But amidst all this debauchery, there was one man that everyone wanted to stop and listen to because he wrote some books, starting with one called Game of Thrones. So I managed to extricate him from the orgies and drag him into a cupboard for a chat. George, welcome to Thronecast. Well, I'm glad to be here. The first thing we ask anyone who, uh, who we talk to is, um, before working on the, on the show, had you read the books? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Which character did you see most of yourself in? I think Tyrion is probably who I would like to be, and uh, Sam is probably closer to who I actually am. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> uh, I'm not nearly as witty as Tyrion. Um, well, actually, I am as witty as Tyrion since I invent all of his witty things. <laughs> but it takes me ages to uh, to invent all of those yeah, witty things. Yeah, you can do it off yeah. the cuff. That's you have right. To labor yeah. over it. I'm sure, I'll uh, do this when I watch this interview on Thronecast. I'll say, God, I should have said that there. That would have been really funny. <laughs> and Tyrion, of course, would think of it right away and of would course. just uh, toss off those comments. <laughs> Do you think that Song of Ice and Fire is, is the book that you've always had, or the story that you've always ins had inside of you, or is it just a story in your canon? It's the biggest thing I've ever done, it's the most ambitious thing I've ever done, and, and uh, I hope that uh, I will finish these last two books and complete this series strongly. Mm. Um, and then I will live another 20, 30 years and write many more things, many different things in the, in the years to come. And you can see the whole of that interview, and I'd advise you to prepare a flask of tea and some sandwiches, because it's a proper good long one, at sky.com stroke Game of Thrones. And while you're there, you can have a look at all the other interviews we've amassed over the last few weeks, including Charles Dance, Alfie Allen and Amelia Clark. Now, there are only two people that know more than George R.R. R. Martin himself about the world he created, and that's Elio and Linda. And here they are. Look, hello. Hi, Hi Jeff. Jeff. Hi. 
Right, first off, Marjorie Tyrell. Now, she's not a character that featured that much in the book, at the time at least. Why do you think she's been promoted? Right, Marjorie, uh, officially a virgin Tyrell. I, um, I think that part of it is the fact that I don't think Natalie Dormer is supposed to be playing an innocent 16-year-old, precisely. So they've definitely decided to give her a bit more of a overtly political role right off. Another thing I wanted to ask you about is this, this big, strapping, stocky, for want of a better word, butch girl, uh, Brienne of Tarth. What do we know about her? Well, we know quite a bit more in the books about Brienne. She is uh, the only child of uh, Lord Selvin of Tarth, and um, seeing as it, she probably was quite a big butch thing, even as a little girl, he decided that uh, A, he didn't have a son, and B, she was probably going to be very hard to marry off, so he indulged her and allowed her to train as a warrior. And, and Laura seems really sort of bothered by her. Is it just because he was humiliated or is it because she's big and butch and maybe uh, Renly might fancy her? Part, part of it is the fact that he was defeated. That has to sting a lot. He's sort of the greatest warrior in the Reach and having a woman beat him is quite a shame. The other part of it is he can't understand why Renly would want to have someone who's ugly around him all the time. But as Renly explains, it's he knows that all that Brienne wants is to serve him and be near him. Everyone else, even even Loras, wants something more from him. She just wants to serve him and that, that would make a something great for a guard. Great, that clears that up. Elio, Linda, thank you very much. See you next week. Our pleasure. That's everything for now, but don't forget if you miss Game of Thrones, or if you want to watch it again, it's on Anytime, Anytime Plus and Sky Go right now. And we'll be back after episode four, Garden of Bones, with more amazing exclusive interviews with superb people. And remember, a small man can cast a very large shadow. But I can do rabbit's heads, look!